Outside, the echo of a gunshot grabbed Seijin and the other's attention. Joseph told Seijin to stay back. Jung Ho was shocked and pained to see the cop with a bullet in his leg. Someone mentioned that they always got criticized because of that cop. The detective whom Jason knew urged them to help the drug squad catch real drug offenders. Another not-so-friendly cop warned Detective Na, who soon got scared after a gun was pointed at him. While one cop was hurting, the other explained they responded to a report about a druggy slasher. Suyin then stomped on the noisy cop, surprised at their seemingly polite behavior despite being trashy. Detective Na knew Suyin and the others were sent by Jason to protect the kids. He was impressed by Suyin's calmness, even when facing a gun. Jung Ho, recognizing the detective, laughed, remembering when he had saved Detective Na before he experienced death. This made Detective Na mad, saying the thugs were cheaters, attacking him from behind. Suyin joined the conversation, talking about Detective Na as an honorable but not very strong fighter. She wondered how he discovered their location. Just then, Jang showed up and said that CEO Han had close connections with the police department. This led to the factory being labeled as a victim of arson. Detective Na questioned if they could trust Jason's friends since he didn't know them. Suyin asked for Detective Na's trust, suggesting they team up since they were heading in the same direction. She strongly recommended capturing and murdering the bad guys. Detective Na suggested hiding in the trash cops first, and they moved and talked. Later at a cafe, Suyin found out that the villains had already influenced higher-ups, including the drug squad detectives. Detective Na was surprised by their bold actions and relieved to find a link between the police and the drug factory. He mentioned the difficulty in getting off Jason from the wanted list. Suyin suggested taking action, but Detective Na wanted to expose the police's secrets first. Suyin then asked about Detective Na's investigation into drug dealers and student fights on the dark web. She was angry at CEO Hanan for continuously sending people to harm Hajin and others. He justified it as strange entertainment for VIP customers. Suyin asked for the identities of CEO Han and Chief Kim. Despite learning that CEO Han was part of the Jiu-Jitsu national team, his records had been erased. Suyin urged Jang to dig deeper, making Detective Jang realize he was following her orders unconsciously. Detective Na then mentioned having an informant linked to the dark web. Shortly after, ji arrived before sang -Soo. She then noticed Suyin, who quickly instructed her to sit down for work. The detective sighed and requested the information. She explained that the dark web had served as a bypass server, making it challenging to locate the real one. She informed them about a courier handling deliveries for the drug factory. She had been tailing an employee of the courier company and uncovered someone suspicious. A woman who was not from a wealthy background but had a lot of luxurious brands. Patiently, she traced everything while anticipating a substantial order from the drug factory. Unfortunately, all her efforts crumbled when the factory burned down, causing the courier to vanish from her radar. She kept ranting about how her hard work turned useless, but Suyin reassured her that the personal information of the employee would suffice. With her usual smirk, she declared she would return within a day. Shortly ago, a woman kept looking at an expensive bag in a fancy store and caught the eye of an employee. The employee was curious about what was going on, and the woman seemed visibly upset. She argued that she had been checking out the bag, so the employee shouldn't ignore her and should do something about it. The employee apologized and assured the woman that she would bring the bag to her, thinking that a more direct communication would have been enough. However, the woman thought that the employee had insulted her silently. She based this on the employee's expression and, in response, raised her hand, saying she had spent more at the store than the employee had earned in her entire life. The employee apologized again but swatted away the woman's hand, insisting it was a defensive move and not an attack. Feeling shocked, the woman demanded to speak to the owner of the store. The employee, confused, asked whether she meant the mall owner or the store manager. The woman in her confusion asked for the store manager and then hurriedly left for the washroom, feeling embarrassed by the situation. In the washroom, the woman started ranting about how customer service workers were acting confident nowadays and not knowing their places. Just then, the washroom door opened and was immediately locked by someone. The woman realized that it would be useless to rant to the store manager and just noticed that someone was behind her. A hooded woman then grabbed her head and smashed it into the sink. The woman's face was totally busted, and she started shrieking in pain. The hooded woman was Suyin, and she asked the woman for the delivery driver's personal information. However, the woman was more focused on the fact that her face was busted and threatened Suyin that she would go to prison for it. Suyin didn't mind her words and kicked the woman's face instead. 
She asked the woman again for the delivery driver's personal information. Trembling in fear, the woman asked Suyin to be more specific since she didn't know what she was talking about. Suyin punched the woman's forehead and made her head fall down to the sink. A fist mark was imprinted on the woman's forehead, and she started screaming in pain once again. Suyin asked the woman for the delivery driver's personal information for the third time. Soon after, in a random area, a delivery man was delivering his last parcel for the day. Suddenly, he noticed someone was already waiting outside and asked for the woman's name to check her identity. Suyin removed her hood and asked the delivery man to tell her all the people who were working under Kim. Flustered, the delivery man claimed he was only a normal delivery driver and acted ignorant. Suyin told the delivery man that she was not from the police and asked for everyone involved and the new location of the temporary factory. The delivery man then removed his glasses and wondered if the woman had told her everything. He then started preparing to fight all claiming this was the reason they kept changing personnel. He then asked why Suyin was bothering them and was excited to have alone time with a woman. Suyin refused his invitation and told him to remain single forever. The delivery man promised not to make it painful for Suyin if she agreed. He then claimed that he was not a normal delivery man but someone who did some cleanup to erase evidence. He decided to enjoy Suyin's body first before disposing of her. Suyin then wondered if they were having time to introduce themselves and asked if she could have time to do the same. Feeling excited, the delivery man told her to take her time since he wanted to learn more about her. Suyin then agreed while shifting her line of sight sideways. With her usual smirk, she claimed that she was a huge natural liar and everyone's big brother appeared behind the delivery man. The delivery man had noticed someone behind him and Big Bro grabbed his head by the hair. Big Bro didn't like how the delivery man spoke, so he dragged him to another place to teach him a lesson. He hit the delivery man against a nearby wall, completely smashing his face. Big Bro pulled him back and told him to greet the wall again. The delivery man's face collided with the wall once more, and Big Bro did it repeatedly. The delivery man could only groan in pain. Big Bro wished people like the delivery man could understand their situation and quietly go away. He found it bothersome to deal with someone like a pest and preferred they take care of themselves. After noticing the smudge of blood on the wall, Suyin informed Big Bro that she needed to gather more information from the delivery man. She wondered if he was upset because the delivery man had spoken to him in an informal way. Surprisingly, the delivery man chuckled, and they realized they could still question him. Impressed by Big Bro's strength, the delivery man expressed a desire to spar with Suyin as well. Big Bro, feeling resigned, decided to extract information after a bit more beating. The delivery man smirked and made his move. Big Bro soon realized that the guy was skilled in grappling. Attempting to seize Big Bro's leg, the delivery man bragged about injuring people for a living. However, Big Bro effortlessly lifted him up and delivered a powerful punch to his head. The delivery man tumbled to the ground, disoriented. Big Bro asserted that acting like a madman wouldn't help the delivery man win. He reminded him that, compared to what Suyin would do, Big Bro's actions were relatively merciful. Big Bro urged the delivery man to answer their questions obediently. Suyin had started questioning the delivery man about his connections and the shipping process of the products. The delivery man chuckled and decided to share some information. He admitted that they would maintain records to make it appear like routine deliveries. If any issues arose, a woman from their group would manipulate the files. They would switch the illegal items while passing through the delivery company, buying time for the investigation to divert its focus. During this period, they would eliminate all evidence and establish another factory. Curious about who the delivery man was connected to, Suyan inquired about contacting them. The delivery man revealed that he was only linked to Kim's people and refused to disclose how to reach them. Frustrated, Suyan contemplated murdering him but the delivery man explained that he couldn't provide the information as they only contacted him when necessary, anticipating Suyen's group's intervention. Suyen, considering more drastic measures, suggested cutting off the delivery man's toes to make him talk. However, he calmly stated that he couldn't reveal more details as they expected Suyen's group to come, and he was just a decoy. Realizing this, Suyen acknowledged that the delivery man lacked countermeasures and was essentially a diversion. Amused by Suyen's reaction, the delivery man praised her, and Suyin wondered who their real target was, realizing they had lured her out. The delivery man hinted that it could be the cute one. Meanwhile, Joseph felt something strange, and Hajin wondered if they were being followed again. Joseph said that the people watching them had suddenly disappeared, and he found it relieving. 
Back with Suyin, she laughed because she knew that no one could harm Hajin as long as Joseph was with him 24 7 However, it would be different if they went overboard and sent a hundred people against him. The delivery person understood that approaching Hajin would be difficult and asked Suyin why people were still being sent after them, even though it seemed pointless. Suyin asked again, and the delivery person called her an idiot for not realizing that they weren't only targeting Hajin. On a different street, Sijin was walking peacefully when a hand holding a siren reached out from behind him. A blonde person stabbed Sijin with it and injected a drug. Suyin realized that Sijin had also become a target. The message conveyed that they were no longer interested in Hajin. She was merely a tool to force Sijin into a fight. The person delivering the message declared that gathering monsters and resorting to violence was pointless, as power was more intimidating than violence. He strongly believed that power was everything and expressed his anger towards them. Suyin inquired about Jung Ho's location, and Big Bro confirmed that the eccentric boy was occupied with something else. She then asked if Douyin was with Sijin, but he was likely busy practicing for his upcoming match. Suyin decided to go to Sijin and entrusted things to Big Bro, who assured her that he could handle the situation alone. Confused, the delivery man wondered what Big Bro meant by handling things. Big Bro reminded the delivery man of his earlier words about power being scarier than violence. He planned to ask him about it again after he had turned into a corpse, wondering if the delivery man would still have the same thoughts. Back to Sijin, the syringe got injected properly into his neck, and the blonde bully laughed loudly because Sijin was in deep trouble. Confused, Sijin scratched his neck and wondered what the blonde bully was up to. The blonde bully got confused too, wondering why nothing was happening. Just then, Sijin started falling down, and the blonde bully began celebrating. However, Sijin was only pretending and threw an uppercut at the bully, sending him to the ground. Sijin finally recognized him after seeing his yellow hair clearly. He thought Kim had already taken care of them, but it seemed like the bully was still lively, engaging in his trashy antics. There was no response, and Sijin realized that the bully was knocked out again in one shot. He then noticed the syringe and wondered if it was the one stuck in him. Wondering what it was since it didn't have an immediate effect, Sijin, knowing they were involved with drugs, planned to ask Suyin about it. At that moment, a man appeared and informed him that he wouldn't discover anything after using the syringe. Surprised, Sijin cursed and took a defensive stance. Kang informed him that Sijin's body would react to it soon. Sijin wondered if it was a laxative. Kang sighed and reminded him about Young Gun. He was using the same drug, and Kang claimed it would be helpful for Sijin in his fight against CEO Han. He further warned Sijin to be cautious and take the drug regularly, or he would suffer severe side effects that even hospitals couldn't solve. Sijin broke into a cold sweat. Kang told him to focus on preparing for his match against CEO Han while he delivered the drug periodically. In a flashback, CEO Han discovered in his room that Jason's friends had teamed up with the detectives, and there was little they could do about it. Kim explained that the police had limited options because their opponents were acting independently. Also, there was no evidence against them, as they were careful not to leave any while being tracked. Kim realized the other side was using a strategy similar to theirs. C.E. Ohan confronted Kim, expressing frustration and accusing him of not solving anything. Kim glared at him and suggested implementing the last idea he had proposed. Han asked for a reminder and Kin recommended administering their experimental drug to Sijin, as suggested by the VIP. He believed it might yield better results than with Young Gun. Kim thought it was the right time to approach Sijin since the other side was more focused on Hajin. Kim wanted Sijin to become dependent on the drug and experience withdrawal symptoms. To avoid suspicion, they could advise Sijin to concentrate on his match to divert attention from digging into information. Kim claimed the drug would be considered effective if Sijin showed improvement due to it. C.E. Han disagreed and claimed he would still think about it. He asked Kim to find other ways, like discovering Suyen's weakness or information about the gangster. Kim mentioned that there was no additional information on the gangster, except for his retirement, while Jason's and Suyen's military records were strictly confidential. Kim suggested drugging Sijin again, which made C.E. Han express his frustration with a curse. Both Kim and Kang were confused, C.E. Ohan stood up and couldn't believe that Kim couldn't get his act together. He informed Kim that he could only receive good treatment if he handled things well, but it would be different if he kept making mistakes. C.E. Ohan warned Kim not to bring it up again unless he was the one to initiate the discussion. 
Kim calmly agreed and decided to explore other methods. Later in a different room, Kang told Kim how he had noticed that CEO Han's judgments had been unclear recently. He wondered if it was because of Han's mood or the medicine for his injured leg. Kim stated that people become more honest when they are anxious and their true feelings show through their expressions and actions. Kang then pondered what to do since he had already informed the delivery courier. Kim affirmed this as he knew that Suyin would take the bait and that would be the time when Sejun would be alone for sure. Kang was surprised as it meant that Kim intended to proceed with the plan of drugging Sejun and he would take responsibility for it. Back in the present, Sejun felt an odd sensation, his hands trembling. Kang noticed that the new medicine was more effective than Young Gun's prescription. Annoyed, Sejun questioned why they were giving him this drug. He pondered whether CEO Han would benefit if he became stronger, suspecting internal conflicts within their group. Kang, like a robot, reminded Sejin about his upcoming match, but suddenly, a fist struck Kang's face. Sejin surprised Kang with his sudden increase in speed. Sejin wondered if he could use Kang as a practice dummy and smack Kang's face as if swatting a huge mosquito. Kang groaned in pain, and Sejin realized something while under the influence of the drug. He couldn't believe that they had used a strong drug on a girl. Kang tried to explain and warned Sejin that he might have an adrenaline overdose if he didn't calm down. Sejin laughed it off, thinking they wanted him to get aggressive by injecting the drug openly. Kang tried to explain further but was interrupted by Sejin's fist. Sejin continued punching Kang's face with a smile until blood appeared. Hysterically laughing, Sejin enjoyed seeing Kang beaten up by a kid. Sejin stopped punching but Kang struggled to speak as his mouth couldn't move properly. Sejin still couldn't believe that Kim had sent a drug for him to test. He asked Kang again how it felt to be beaten up by a kid, wondering if Kang would endure more hits since that's the kind of person they were. Sejin raised his fist to continue, but someone intervened. An arm wrapped around his neck, and Sejin asked them to let go. Suyin sighed, saying it was too hot, and called Sejin hopeless. She asked Sejin to calm down, promising to put him to sleep. Some time ago at the boxing gym, Sumian asked Hajin if she had a location tracking app. She wanted Hajin to have it just in case something happened when Joseph wasn't paying attention, and Hajin agreed. Joseph reassured them not to worry, as he wouldn't get distracted. However, Sumian reminded him that he had a small bladder and might mess up during bathroom breaks. Hajin remembered how often Joseph would go to the bathroom. Si Jun, upon hearing this, also became curious and wanted to install a similar app on his phone. Suyin said someone who looked like a mountain didn't need it, but Sejin just wanted to be sure in such a scary world. Eventually, Suyin agreed. Just before Suyin found Sejin, she rode around the area on her bike, hoping that nothing bad had happened. When she learned about the plan to promote a match between Sejin and Han, she questioned why they would bother Sejin for it. Then she remembered the drugs and realized they were using Sejin to promote them, even though Han would likely lose the fight. Eventually, Suyin found Sejin, who seemed fine, but he was beating up Kang intensely. She argued that it wasn't Sejin's responsibility to murder someone but hers. Suyin then grabbed Sejin's neck and asked him to take a nap. Sejin, feeling disoriented, blamed it on Kang. Despite knowing the situation, Suyin insisted that Sejin should sleep without resisting. With bloodshot eyes, Sejin questioned what was wrong with murdering someone deserving of death. He screamed, asking why Suyin was stopping him as he tried to get up. Suyin couldn't believe that Sejin was rising again despite her chokehold. Sejin roared like a beast and pleaded with her to let go. Shortly after, Sejin awoke with a clear head but seemed puzzled. He was disoriented, and Suyin informed him that he had been knocked out. She advised him to focus on something less troublesome. Sejin, still recovering from the confusion, apologized. Suyin, visibly frustrated, noticed a drug syringe on the floor, realizing that Sejin's behavior was affected by it. Sejin explained that he had been stabbed from behind and felt like he was floating in the clouds. In that altered state, he believed he could take on Han or anyone else. Concerned, Suyin warned him that getting too deep into the effects of that sweet poison could become a difficult situation to escape. Suyin suggested consulting with the detectives, mentioning Jason's success in apprehending drug offenders during the factory explosion. The idea was to find out more about the type of drug involved. Sejin, still grappling with the situation, questioned what to do about the unconscious Kang and the street bully. Suyin reassured him that Jung Ho would handle the cleanup. Later at the police station, Jang told Suyin about Young Dun. 
He had been involved in the drug's clinical trials and used for packing and manufacturing afterward. Kim's approach was to recruit orphans or troublesome kids and train them to fight. Those who showed athletic abilities would be given the drug, and the matches would be recorded to promote the product to potential buyers. Unfortunately, they couldn't gather information about the buyers, and the statements from the drugged individuals were not legally reliable. Suddenly, a prison door opened, and Jang thought it was Young Gun. However, he was confused when he saw a different person. Jang asked Na if the prisoner was truly Young Gun because the person looked entirely different. Young Gun then recognized Suyin as the woman with the knife from when they went to the graveyard to catch Jason. Suyin wondered how Young Gun ended up in his current state. Young Gun explained that he had stopped taking the drug because he knew it was hurting him. Na, informed by the doctors, shared that Young Gun was going through withdrawal, and since it was a new drug, there was no guarantee of improvement. Jang was puzzled, thinking that stopping the drug should make Young Gun better. Na corrected him, stating that Young Gun's case was severe. He had difficulty digesting food, and his language skills were deteriorating. Suddenly, Suyin caught Young Gun's attention and informed him that she would be asking some questions. She proceeded to inquire about Han and Kim, specifically the location where they were planning to provide him with drugs. Young Gun remembered a tall building. Suyin requested the address, but Young Gun hinted that his eyes were always covered whenever he went there. Hearing this, Suyin trusted Do Han's assertion that the individuals involved frequently changed locations. Suyin then pressed Young Gun for any information he had about Kim. Suddenly, Young Gun started trembling, admitting that he knew little about Kim aside from his intimidating reputation. Young Gun mentioned that Kim would consistently observe from a distance and assist Han in various matters. Frustrated by the lack of useful information, Suyin became upset, and Jang attempted to calm her down. Young Gun then shared that he had some knowledge about Han, stating that he was a former member of the national team. However, Suyin, already aware of this, dismissed it as a rumor since it was not officially documented. Young Gun insisted it was true, asserting that Han had a different past. He revealed that Han had a half-sibling and changed his last name at some point. As Young Gun struggled to recall Han Junwoo's previous surname, a flashback started. In the flashback, someone shouted at Jang Junwoo. Han stood there with blood on his mouth, referring to the person as a psychotic bastard. He remained silent while another man on the floor told him to spit out whatever he had in his mouth. Dismissing them as druggies, Han casually mentioned that the man's dumpling ear looked tasty and took a bite out of it. In the past, Suyin inquired with Young Gun for verification. The person with a drug problem asserted that the Jang surname came from Han's mother. However, Han's half-brother contradicted this, stating that their mother had already passed away. Suyin sought more details, but Young Gun had no additional information. Nevertheless, he did remember something about Han's half-brother. He gave off the impression of being the son of a wealthy person. The same half-brother had requested someone to provide him with the VIP list. Kim speculated whether Han's brother was searching for someone among the prosecution members on the list. He then inquired about Han's well-being and whether he had been to the hospital. Kim confirmed that Han's leg had somewhat recovered, allowing him to walk. He had been discharged from the hospital on the anniversary of his mother's death. Han's brother expressed frustration considering it pointless to take care of someone who was already dead. He instructed Kim to tell Han to return home within the week, as their father had requested his presence. Meanwhile, Han visited a place where ashes are kept. He told his mother that everything had gone wrong. He understood what his mother wanted, but things didn't go as planned. He said he would rather die than lose. If he couldn't win, he would willingly go down and take everyone else with him. He laughed because it was a simple plan but he didn't have a choice. He had lived a difficult life as a bad person and had hurt everyone, including a girl. He laughed because his own brother didn't even care that he got hurt, but a girl would sacrifice herself for a friend who wasn't related by blood. Han was impressed by how Hajin kept getting up and fighting for her friend. When he saw her like that, Han wondered if Hajin's friend would still act the same after seeing her beaten up body. He wanted to test if Hajin would seek revenge or ignore it out of fear. Since there was no response afterward, Han completely ignored and forgot about Hajin's existence. He thought it was the end, but suddenly Sijin appeared and became a crucial person in achieving Han's life goals. Sijin was a persistent, determined hunting dog who always got back up for the sake of his goal. Han's progress slowed down, but he knew he would see the light at the end of the tunnel soon. He asked his mom to understand if he couldn't visit her the next year. Later at the Jiu-Jitsu gym, Suyin and Detective Jang went inside. 
searching for the coach or director. A man informed them that it wasn't the training session time, but the director would arrive soon. Jang attempted to introduce himself as a police officer, but Suyin cut in and asked if the man was an employee or an athlete. The man, claiming to be a former athlete, mentioned that he pursued jujitsu as a hobby while assisting the gym. He responded casually to Suyin's questions. Suyin then inquired if he knew someone named Jang Junwoo, who had been expelled from the national team. The man, becoming uneasy, denied knowledge, but Suyin persistently continued questioning, outshining Jang, who was the supposed police officer. Nervously, the man suggested waiting for the director since he wasn't aware. Despite the awkward situation, he offered them seats and suggested they wait while he stepped out. Surprisingly, Suyin agreed. Jang advised her to be more discreet when using the police's name, reminding her that he was still under suspension. Suyin pointed out the man's anxious behavior, and Jang noticed his limping and stuttering. While jiu-jitsu athletes often had unusual knees, Suyin wanted to observe further. In the afternoon, the gym director arrived, appearing drunk and searching for the man he was looking for earlier. He then noticed Jang, who introduced himself as a police officer. The director got confused and insisted that he had not driven under the influence of alcohol. Jang identified the director and directly mentioned that he wanted information, especially from 10 years ago when the director coached the national team. The director was curious about the investigation and claimed they were not involved in anything illegal. Jang asked if the director knew Junwoo from before and why he left the team. Upon hearing Junwoo's name, the director became flustered and vehemently denied knowing someone like him. Meanwhile, the man from earlier got beaten up and admitted he knew CEO Han. Suyin was relieved that the man finally spoke up, especially since his nervous stutter was evident earlier. The man cried and feared retribution from the director, but Suyin assured him that the director would also confess everything to the detective waiting outside. The man then revealed that Han was the most skilled person on the team, regardless of weight class. Han used to be timid until he learned jujitsu and developed a strong preference for guard play. He was fixated on blocking attacks while guarding from the bottom. However, an incident occurred where anyone who sparred with Han ended up injured. When Suyin inquired about the incident, the man explained that it happened when Han secured second place in major competition. The person who won first place had previously been unable to defeat Han, but it was later revealed that the champion had used illegal drugs to gain an advantage over him. Just before the director came back to the gym, the man from earlier made a call in a hurry. He told someone that the police had questioned about Han, and he suspected it was related to the illegal drug case. Worried about going to prison and with his family in mind, he anxiously waited for the director's return. He was instructed to call the director first, but before he could, Suyun appeared behind him with a wooden bat and with her usual smirk struck him. The person on the other end of the call realized that Han had been caught referred to the gym helper as an idiot, and expressed a desire to cause more harm. Suyin then instructed the man to move and questioned him about involvement in illegal drugs. She warned him to spill everything if he didn't want the same fate for his other leg. The man, unsure where to start, was urged by Suyin to begin with the time he first met Han until Han left the team. In a flashback, the man explained that they initially met as beginners in a small gym. Han quickly showed improvement earning promotions and defeating others with different colored belts. Observing Han's preference for playing guard, the man asked why. Han explained with a smile that he wanted self-defense skills, specifically against monsters. When asked about his career path, Han confidently stated he would represent the national team. Despite not sharing much about his personal life, Han faced challenges, and the man became aware of Han's struggles. Han's rival, Chang Gu, was skilled but had questionable behavior, bullying the weak and relying on luck and politics. Chang-gu disliked Han's intense training and lack of fear in his eyes. Han challenged Chang-gu to a match, and despite Chang-gu's efforts, he couldn't defeat or harm Han due to Han's superior athleticism. The coach, influenced by the director, suggested they take drugs to excel in the upcoming Asian Games. Han, honest and hardworking, opposed the idea, but the coach ignored him. Amidst the tension, the man overheard laughter, discovering it was Chang-gu laughing maniacally. The man explained that Chang-gu had defeated Han in the national team selection match, and the drugs showed better effects. Suyin noticed that some details were skipped and asked how the man ended up with wobbly legs. She also inquired about the person he was talking to, warning him about the possibility of prison. He insisted he shared what he knew and suggested asking the director for more answers. Suddenly, the locker room door opened, 
and Jang revealed he had spoken with the director, learning something about Han and illegal drugs. So Yin mentioned hearing that Han lost to a drug addict, and Jang disclosed there was more to the story. Someone had approached the director to obtain the illegal drug, and the director could only receive it when contacted by that specific person. Jang provided a description. The man had slit eyes, always wore a relaxed expression, and habitually touched his neck due to a noticeable scar. Whenever you met him, he covered his neck no matter what. At the same time, that particular individual, Kim, was conversing with someone familiar. Changu was upset that Kim was now working with Han, wondering if Kim aimed to bring both Han and Changu down. He questioned Kim's confidence, noting that Changu relied on medication for his well-being and advised Kim to follow instructions. Changu declared he wouldn't have done business with Kim if he had known about his association with Han. Puzzled, he questioned why Kim wanted to send Han to hell and asked if he sought to take over the business. Kim thought about it and mused whether he truly needed a reason. With a smile, he stated he was just tired of his old toys. At a grand-looking mansion, Han clenched his fist right before entering. A woman informed him that the vice president had already arrived, and the chairman would be there soon. In the living room, Han's half-brother sarcastically greeted him as usual. Han ignored the remarks and asked why they were summoned. The half-brother didn't know and was already annoyed that Han was called over. Just then, their father entered. The woman from earlier welcomed the chairman and mentioned that his sons were waiting while the food was being prepared. The chairman thanked her for her efforts and inquired if all the employees had already eaten. He reminded everyone not to skip meals and work. In his personal office, Han's half-brother asked about their father's work and offered to take over instead. He insisted that the materials he had prepared would be helpful to the business and suggested addressing issues with public servants he disliked. The chairman then clenched his fist, called his son's name, and quickly threw a punch at him. It was a strong blow that made his son groan in pain. The chairman warned him not to create a superior servant relationship with the prosecution. He wanted to maintain a mutually beneficial relationship to identify their weaknesses, not to protect their pride. If the prosecution did something that could harm their business, he would use their vulnerabilities to safeguard it. He reminded his son not to let personal feelings affect his work as a businessman. He couldn't believe his son was trying to target the entire prosecution just because one prosecutor had ignored him. Han had just witnessed everything and couldn't believe that his father was acting like a machine, as usual. The chairman then requested Han's report. Han explained that a temporary factory was currently in operation, and they would resolve the backlogged orders within a week. He planned to demonstrate the medicine's effectiveness, aside from using Sejin as a test subject. The chairman glared at him and asserted that the VIPs were not patient enough for another method. Han suggested testing the drug himself. The chairman was surprised and questioned whether Han's beliefs had vanished, considering the competitive nature of society. Han agreed that it was time to let go so he could put an end to it. The chairman asked for other ideas, but Han claimed there were, and it was his job to take action. The chairman wished Han had realized this earlier, otherwise his mother would have felt at ease in heaven. He then realized he was starting to talk nonsense. The half-brother stood up, declaring that Han's words were always lies and that Han didn't even know what his underlings were doing. The chairman sought more details in Han. Confused, admitted that Kim had already ordered someone to administer the drug to Si Jun. Surprised, Han asked again if Kim had really taken action. Since Han was slow to act, Kim had already tested the drugs on Si Jun without Han knowing. Han apologized to the chairman, promising to figure it out and report back. He apologized for skipping the meal and asked to leave first. The half-brother scoffed, calling Han knave. Han hadn't expected the parasitic Kim to go to such lengths to bring him down. Shortly after, Han returned to his office and found Kim lounging on the sofa. Kim saw a leg flying toward his face, and Han successfully landed a kick. Han asked Kim to keep things in mind. Angered, Han reminded Kim that he was not human but Han's dog. He wanted Kim to wait when told to wait before boiling him to death. Kim tried to explain to Han that he didn't understand what Han was talking about. Han warned him not to ignore the situation and questioned whether he had actually given Si Jim the drug. Kim finally grasped Han's concern and argued that it wouldn't be enjoyable if Si Jin didn't perform as well as Han. Kim insisted it was his duty to oversee the athletes in the event. Han pressed Kim to reveal the true reason for his actions as they deviated from the instructions. However, Kim was more interested in gaining recognition from the chairman and vice president. As Han physically confronted Kim, 
Ken noticed that Han shared a similar fierce nature with the two leaders. Han, angered by Kim's behavior, threatened him and mentioned that team leader Kang wouldn't come to his aid. Unbothered, Kim revealed that he had arranged an insurance policy because he couldn't contact Kang lately. He teasingly told Han to greet a mutual acquaintance, and suddenly, Chan Gu appeared behind them. Chan Gu playfully greeted Han as if they were best friends, but Han seemed confused about why Chan Gu was there. Chan Gu felt hurt because he thought Han was being impolite, wondering if Han was still whining like a main character from a drama. He mentioned being in a drama himself after Han bit off his ears. Han argued that even if he chewed up the ear, he wouldn't be happy at all. In a flashback, Han was crying in front of a room. He asked his mother to hold on a bit longer and promised to get stronger than his father and brother. He asked his mother not to cry, assuring her it would happen for sure. This was the time when Han looked up on the internet how to get stronger and discovered jujitsu. Years later, Han surprised his half-brother, tackling him to the ground. Despite threats from his brother, Han claimed he would really murder him. The struggle continued, and the chairman watched his sons duke it out. After finding out that Han was exercising, he talked to Han, who explained he was into a sport called jujitsu. The chairman, having heard from Han's mother that he was talented, insisted Han could compete as an athlete. Han insisted he was just enjoying the sport, but the chairman told him humility wouldn't help him succeed. He called humility useless and advised Han to express himself more and strive for success. Han was ordered to compete as a national team member in the Asian Games and bring home a gold medal. Success in this endeavor would lead to Han being officially accepted into the family, and his mother would become the chairman's formal wife. However, years later, Han lost to Changu, who he knew was taking drugs. Changu playfully apologized to Han for taking his position, telling him to consider himself unlucky. At that moment, Han noticed his mother and the chairman leaving the area. His mother looked at him, and Han was confused. He saw his mother's lips move as if she was saying something, though he didn't know the exact words. Han sensed they were warm words. Unfortunately, that was the last time Han saw his mother. Some time ago at the chairman's mansion, he was puzzled about why Han's mother approached him, especially after she had claimed not to seek help from him before. He wondered if raising a child alone was challenging for her as he noticed her struggling. Han's mother then shared with him that she was dealing with cancer and was in a critical condition. The chairman was taken aback by this revelation. Han's mother went on to express her hope that, after her passing, the chairman would become the only family Han had left. She requested that he take on the responsibility of raising Han, providing him with the same opportunities as the chairman's own son. Knowing the chairman to be a reasonable person, she believed he would consider the future of the company and the need for capable individuals. She wished for Han to become accustomed to life in the mansion before her inevitable passing. This marked the beginning of Han's residence in the chairman's house. At that time, Han desired a comfortable home for his mother. However, circumstances took a turn when Han found himself alone in the mansion. Han grieved alone in front of his mother. His sparing buddy later visited the burial, but before discussing anything else, Han inquired if he was aware of Changu's medication. He was curious whether his friend knew about Changu's drug addiction, as it wouldn't have been an issue if it had only been used for a day or two. The friend admitted that the director had instructed them to keep it a secret from Han. Despite thinking that Han would emerge victorious due to his superior athleticism, the friend expressed surprise with a smile. Han acknowledged that he hadn't realized things were happening behind his back and still appreciated his friend's presence as no one else had come to see his mother. He encouraged his friend to leave first and assured him that he would join him at training after taking care of his mother. Some days ago, Jin Hyung advised Han to take a break and offered assistance, but Han just laughed saying he received a lot of money from his mother's life insurance. Looking for their coach, Han found him outside, likely drinking. Remembering that his sparing buddy won a gold medal, Han suggested warming up. Jin Hyung agreed, and they met on the mat after Han changed into his uniform. Suddenly, Han went on the offensive, surprising Jin Hyung who knew Han preferred playing defensively. Han smirked and grabbed Jin Hyung's ankle, gripping it hard and pinning him down. Despite Jin Hyung trying to tap out, Han wouldn't let go, impressed by Jin Hyung's flexibility due to drugs. Jin Hyung exclaimed he already tapped out, but Han tightened his grip, asking for more passion. Jin Hyung screamed in pain, attracting attention. Chang Gu laughed, seeing Han's true nature. Jin Hyung asked why Han broke his ankle, and Han admitted he didn't expect it to break easily. 
Han cheerfully informed Jin Hyung he couldn't continue for the Asian Games and advised others to take him to the hospital. Chang Gu confronted Han, telling him to stop complaining about not being selected for the Asian Games. Han laughed, confident he could beat Chang Gu without drugs. Chang Gu suggested Han should have taken drugs to win. Han refused, stating he wouldn't resort to drugs and that it would be his last respect for Chang Gu as a colleague. Now in the present, Han remembered the unpleasant taste of bad things. Chang Gu rolled on the ground, holding his bleeding right ear. Han reminded Chang Gu that both his ears were gone and showed his bloodied tongue. In a previous memory, Han found himself grappling with Chang Gu, who had assumed a comfortable defensive position. Han, visibly exhausted, struggled to maintain control. Chang Gu, feeling at ease, asserted that he wasn't fatigued due to his drug use. Han, determined to prove himself, assured Chang Gu of his impending victory without specifying the martial art. Chang Gu, amused, questioned whether Han would resort to striking instead, taunting him as a loser. In response, Han unexpectedly bit into Chang Gu's ear, causing it to bleed. In a startling move, Han tore off Chang Gu's ear, leaving it visibly detached. Chang Gu's screams echoed through the gym. Unfazed, Han remarked that Chang Gu's loud cries contradicted his claim of using drugs to numb pain. At that moment, the coach entered, witnessing the aftermath and labeling Han as crazy for his actions. In the past, Chang Gu cried out in pain when his second ear was bitten off. Han exclaimed that Chang Gu had just become uglier. Kim scratched his head, observing the bad situation. Chang Gu stood up and ran towards Han, threatening to chew him alive. Han advised against it, but he was confident he would taste better than Chang Gu. Curious about how Chang Gu would manage to chew him, Han slapped him hard and told him to be more realistic with his words. Han began to beat up Chang Gu, emphasizing that he was no longer the same jiu-jitsu athlete who only grappled. Chang Gu realized that Han had become a skilled fighter. Falling to the floor, Han remarked that Chang Gu couldn't participate in the Asian Games since his left ear was gone. Han declared he would go even if his whole body was torn apart and criticized Chang Gu for getting up easily when things went wrong, calling him a weakling. At that moment, Han noticed that Kim was not in the scene. He saw a rat and followed it, telling Kim to stop being scared and running away. Kim insisted that he wasn't afraid. Han grabbed Kim's neck, asking him to stop pretending to be strong. Han wanted to teach him a lesson and make him realize the consequences. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. Han wondered who it was, and Kim smiled, saying that problems couldn't be solved with fists in the current era. Han's eyes widened when he saw his father entering the room. The chairman was disappointed that Han still held on to his beliefs. He agreed with Kim's suggestions, considering them the quickest and most effective method. Han argued that he could defeat Sejin because he was stronger. But the chairman reminded him that Sejin was an amateur compared to a professional athlete like Han. He pointed out the curiosity of watching someone drugged up fight against a skilled athlete. The chairman announced that Kim would now lead the project to exploit the weaknesses of VIPs. He told Han to focus on preparing for the fight so he wouldn't appear clumsy in front of the VIPs. Han, confused and dazed, insisted that he was the only one who could give orders to Kim. The chairman questioned who told him that and clarified that he only placed Han in charge of Kim and assigned him tasks. He reiterated the need for Han to discard his beliefs and concentrate on fight preparation. Han, still dazed, was left bewildered. Kim then taunted Han, wishing him luck with his training and wearing a sleigh smile. Furious, Han vowed to settle the score with Kim after the project. At the boxing gym, Doyen sparred with someone. He groaned in pain, finding the situation tough. When he got hit in the body, he realized he wasn't skilled enough to win. Falling to the floor and groaning, he understood he needed improvement. Sejin asked Doyen if fighting like that against Han might be enough for him to win. Meanwhile, Suyin watched them from outside the ring and asked Sejin if he had been drunk. She then told Doyen to leave the ring and informed him that he wouldn't win against a drug user. Doyen agreed, but in his head, he still couldn't believe that Sejin had beaten him at his own game. Suyin told him not to blame himself since drug users had more strength beyond their comprehension. Doyen just agreed, responding like a dead robot. Sejin had told Suyin that he was planning to take more drugs and confront Han. Suyin advised him against relying on drugs, warning that it would inevitably lead to his destruction. She offered to show Sejun the consequences she spoke of and called out Jung Ho. Jung Ho complained that it was difficult for him to fight fairly due to struggling with controlling his strength. 
Suian encouraged him not to hold back, instructing him to make Seijun understand the dark side of drugs. Despite Jung Ho's concerns, Suian insisted that Jung Ho beat Seijun until he recognized the harm of drug use. Jung Ho agreed, and Suian told him to use only 8% of his real strength. Surprised by her request, Jung Ho prepared for the fight, asking Suian to intervene if anything went wrong. Si Jun, unsure if Jung Ho could truly go all out, felt confident in his ability after defeating Doan. Jung Ho, staring at Si Jun, urged him to unleash his full strength. The fight commenced abruptly, catching Si Jun off guard as Jung Ho's fist smashed into his face. Laughing at Si Jun's surprise, Jung Ho explained that the punch was a technique he had developed. He threw another punch, calling it a mindless blow designed to deceive opponents. Si Jun, hit by the punch, remarked that the name wasn't appropriate. Jung Ho celebrated adding another druggie murder to his record, laughing and questioning if Doyin had truly lost to a druggie in the ring. Suyin intervened, telling Jung Ho to take the fight seriously and explaining that adrenaline could accelerate the drug's effects. She assured that the match wouldn't end so easily, and suddenly, Se Jin appeared behind Jung Ho. Jung Ho boasted that no one could survive his special punch, but Se Jin's fist was already heading towards him. Se Jin relentlessly punched Jung Ho, unleashing a flurry of blows like a relentless beast. As Se Jin followed with an uppercut, Jung Ho realized the drug was having a strong effect, contemplating its compatibility with Se Jin. Although he acknowledged its effectiveness, Jung Ho despised the determined look in Se Jin's eyes, wondering if it could be changed. In Han's workplace, he finished his shift right on time, and as he was about to clock out, someone approached him. Han was aware that this manager often made him work overtime by assigning extra tasks. The manager informed him that leaving on time wasn't allowed, and everyone else was working extra hours. Han explained that he was still recovering, but the manager insisted he pick up some materials since the usual person was also injured. Han contemplated the idea of confronting the manager, thinking about how the company could still function without him. Suddenly, a person from the marketing team appeared, looking for the manager. They engaged in a lively conversation. The man introduced himself as Jae Sung, a familiar face from the Jiu-Jitsu gym. The manager greeted him, seemingly ignoring Han's presence. Han, glaring at Jae Sung, recalled their previous encounters at the gym. Jae Sung attempted to introduce himself to Han, who initially turned away, but eventually recognized him. Han approached Jae Sung, expressing amazement at how small the world is. Despite the earlier frustration, Han suggested they go for drinks, happy to see a familiar face. Some time ago, Jae Sung's manager approached him and requested that he meet with the management support team because the person in charge was on a business trip. Jae Sung accepted the task with a smile, but in his mind he was upset because he wouldn't be able to do jujitsu later. The manager entrusted everything to Jae Sung and left. Feeling overwhelmed, Jae Sung considered resigning due to the unnecessary overtime work. Despite this, he went to the management support team department and met Han, who was happy to see him. The manager wondered if they knew each other, and Han explained that they were acquaintances. After the meeting, the manager invited Han to join them for drinks. Nervously, Jae Sung asked the manager if he could quickly return to his desk to retrieve something. The manager told him to be fast and left quietly, while Han watched him with a smile. Jae Sung went to the washroom and locked himself in a stall. He felt panicked and wanted to inform others about what he had just discovered. Instead of calling, he chose to send a text. While doing so, he realized that Han shared the same last name as the chairman. Trying to calm down, he noticed a shadow over him. Looking up, he asked Han what he was doing. Han explained he was eliminating an unexpected problem. He entered the stall and attempted to kick Jae Sung, who narrowly avoided it. Jae Sung asked him to wait and suggested talking since they were at work. While speaking, Han threw a punch, but Jae Sung surprisingly dodged it. Impressed, Han started banging on the door. Soon, Jae Sung was thrown out of the stall along with the door. Despite trying to break his fall, Jae Sung was unsuccessful. Begging Han to stop the violence, he revealed he knew what Han wanted. Han questioned him, and Jae Sung promised not to disclose what he had seen. He emphasized that it would be detrimental to his position in the company, but Han was hesitant to trust him. Jae Sung expressed his commitment to working in the company until he died. He promised to inform others and swore that he wasn't close to Seijin in the first place. However, Jae Sung was just spreading lies and would do the opposite once he escaped. Han knew that, though, and explained to Jae Sung why cats don't murder a bug as soon as they catch it. He claimed that the cat would play with the bug, giving it more hope as if it were a game. 
Jae Sung then pleaded to be let go and unexpectedly went for a surprise tackle. Despite Jae Sung's smirk, Han easily grabbed and lifted him off the floor. Han then knocked Jae Sung down on the hard floor, causing Jae Sung to cry out in pain. Han was impressed by Jae Sung's talkative nature and grabbed his hair like a rag. He didn't want to go easy and only thought of a fitting ending for Jae Sung. Han dragged Jae Sung to one of the urinals and made him face it. Han said this would be a dramatic conclusion, an accident during overtime hours, ensuring compensation for himself. Han told Jae Sung to have a safe trip and stomped his face on the hard urinal, splattering blood all over it. Han continued stomping on Jae Sung's head like a rag, and blood continued to splatter around until Jae Sung's face turned into a mosaic. Han told Jae Sung to find him if the company wouldn't give him compensation, even offering to provide implants if he survived until that time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and see you next time.